Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, first of all, thanks for everyone who joined this session. My name is Yang Tang. I'm a maintainer of CoreDNS project. Yang Tang is my GitHub handle. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions uh, after the session and you want to ask, you can always reach out to me in GitHub. My GitHub profile also consists of my email, so you can send me email as well if you like. Uh, in today's session, I'm going to discuss about several things. First of all, I'm going to give a brief introduction of coding as. Uh, after that, I will also discuss about the coding as project uh, community as well as the latest update. And then I will discuss about the survey discovery and the DNS, especially about uh, how to use coding as for survey discovery. Uh, finally, I will uh, walk through a, a Golang plugin for CoreDNS and show you how easy it is to write a Golang plugin for CoreDNS in less than 100 lines of code. As many of you know, CoreDNS is a flexible DNS server written in Golang. It has a focus on service discovery. Uh, the biggest difference between CoreDNS and other DNS server is that uh, CoreDNS has a plugin-based architecture. It can be easily extended. What does that mean? If you have any new feature or anything that you want and you are not able to find it in existing plugins, you can actually write the plugin yourself as long as you know how to write in Golang. Actually, at the end of the session, I will walk you through one demo plugin to show it. Uh, CoreDNS has been the default DNS server since uh, several years ago, and because of that, if you, uh, uh, if you ever use Kubernetes, you certainly have already used CoreDNS. Uh, CoreDNS uh, uh, is a DNS server, first and foremost. So it supports DNS. It also supports some of the DNS-related protocol like uh, DNS over TOS and DNS over gRPC. The latest uh, development in DNS is that there are some additional protocols like uh, DNS over ATP3 uh, being discussed and being uh, standardized. We are working on to adding additional protocol support for, D for core DNS as well. Uh, the biggest feature for core DNS uh, in comparison with other DNS, uh, DNS server is that uh, DNS, core DNS has a very rich cloud uh, integration. Uh, as you can see, coding and support uh, different uh, cloud, uh, uh, cloud data sync up with uh, different windows like uh, AWS Rock 3 like uh, Azure DNS, like uh, Google Cloud DNS. Uh, the project of coding as was started by Mick Jibben several years ago. Actually, I think Mick started the project around uh, 2016. Uh, it has been almost seven years. Uh, so I'm going to say it's a successful project, uh, has, been, has been used widely across the cloud native ecosystem. It also have uh, other usage outside of Kubernetes as well, and I will discuss a little bit in this session. Uh, CoreDNS has a very rich community. We have uh, 300, uh, more than 300 contributors. So here, I'm going to say big thanks to everyone who ever contributed to CoreDNS project or whoever created a pull request. Uh, we have uh, 28 maintainers. Uh, the reason we have so many maintainers is because the standard to be accepted as a maintainer is fairly low for CoreDNS. Uh, if you ever create a significant pull request, one significant pull request, and if you can find a Find a sponsor, find a maintainer as your sponsor. We will add you as a maintainer. That's why you see there are 28 maintainers here. We also have 33 public adopters. The, adopt, the public adopter means if your institution or your company are using CoreDNS and you're willing, your company or institution are willing to share the name in public, you can add the, your company's name in coding as projects website, and that is called a public adopter. Uh, as we all know, there are more than 33 you know, institutions using coding as I'm sure, I'm pretty sure about that. However, many companies didn't share the name in public, that's why we only have 33. But if your company 
uh, are using that and not, uh, not concerned about sharing the name in public, you can add a, uh, you can create a pull request including this project uh, to add a public adopter. That will also mean that you are going to be part of the coding as contributors commun uh, community as well. Uh, as of right now, coding has already reached the 10,000 start, which is a major milestone. If you have not uh, done so, I encourage anyone uh, who has not uh, started coding as to, to click a start now. That uh, let's see when we can reach to the ne next milestone. Uh, the coding as project used to be a project lead based. So essentially, Mick Jiban was the original author of coding as, and he started coding as project uh, in 2016. He has been the project leader since then. Last year, uh, Mick decided to step down. You know, we certainly respect his. Uh, uh, personal choice, and uh, as a result, uh, we converted the project, uh, the project uh, structure from project lead model to a committee model. The steering committee of the project will be uh, are always going to be elected by maintainers. So, if you want to be part of this uh, committee, you want to uh, create a significant pull request to be a maintainer first, and then. Uh, we can see what we uh, what you can do uh, to do more contribution to coding as project. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the project update, especially since the last Kubicon. Uh, several versions of coding as have been uh, released. The latest release was 1.10.1, uh, which uh, uh, which was released in February two, uh, 2023. That's uh, a couple months ago. Uh, in this latest release, it consists of several new uh, several new things. Uh, we introduce a uh, new plugin that's a timeout. We also introduce several new features like ACO allows you now allows you to drop query as action. Uh, the template plugin uh, allows you to create a request with extended uh, DNS errors. The load balancer plugin added a new weighted policy. And finally, the cache plugin uh, gives you the option to serve original record TT, uh, TTOs from cache. Uh, one, one more thing I want to emphasize about the uh, update is the security. Uh, we all know uh, security has been a focus uh, for, the, for the whole industry for the past several years for different reasons. Uh, the coding has, uh, has been built with Golan 1.19 since uh, coding as 1.10. Uh, why that's important? Because the, the old, older version of Golan, especially before 1.17.6, has several security issues. Uh, if you're using old coding as versions, you may notice that the, the, the coding has several upstream related vulnerabilities you want to fix. So that's why we encourage everyone who is using coding as to update, upgrade to the latest version, uh, ideally uh, uh, with 1.10 or plus, uh, 1.10.1. Okay, so next topic I'm going to discuss is about survey discovery. Um, for, for DNS with survey discovery, many people ask a question, actually in the past. Uh, many people ask, it, ask a question about uh, the DNS, the usefulness of DNS in survey discovery. Some, someone even asked me directly, say, hey, uh, in this day and age, you have uh, SDN, SDN can, pretty much do anything, and you can use SDN to wire up any endpoint in any way you like, like in your networking, right? Software-defined networking. Uh, why would you still use DNS? <laughs> That's an interesting question, right? There are several reasons why DNS is important. First of all, DNS is uh, pretty much uh, indirection. But this is a nice indirection you actually want to have in order to have maximum flexibility. The DNS itself, uh, if you configure uh, properly, it can be public facing, which allows you to expose to the whole internet, or you can configure the DNS to be within a certain network, so it's gonna be internal. Uh, DNS is also easy and simple to change. Uh, in fact, any novice IT admin can probably change the DNS record for you, right? 
that's much easier than making any other adjustment. Uh, if you're changing, let's say, cloud vendor, if you're changing, let's say, Kubernetes even configuration, it's uh, the, the learning curve, but DNS is too easy to change. Uh, another thing people probably didn't realize is that the DNS itself is a distributed system. When we talk about distributed system, uh, people always refer to like a REP protocol, which seems to be quite complicated, quite fancy. But DNS itself is also a distributed system, and this is a massively scalable distributed system because the whole internet is backed by DNS, right? Uh, and also, DNS has one thing that's actually many people probably in, you know, in, in Kubicon may not notice. The DNS actually, in Kubicon, many people here uh, building or operating a service that's actually customer facing. You build a service, you want the customer to use that. But DNS uh, has, a, has a usage here, but DNS also is part of the IT infrastructure. So your, your company's IT admin, they are serving the cooperating, uh, co cooperation data, and in this case, they are still using DNS. That's, uh, that's the thing. So in Kubicon, you're talking about customer facing, uh, uh, customer facing uh, services. But in IT world, you're talking about corporate uh, services as well. Uh, because of that, when we talk about DNS, it still has a massive value in this day and age because uh, the flexibility, that's one. Another one is ease of use and the indirection of DNS itself will give you uh, a lot more benefit than in the long run. Okay, okay next thing I'm going to discuss is the uh, multi-cloud. Uh, many people already heard of multi-cloud and uh, many people here probably using multi-cloud. Uh, DNS is actually a nice tool to interact with multi-cloud. Uh, so first of all, why many people, uh, why many companies decide to go with multi-cloud or hybrid cloud? There are several reasons. The first reason is that uh, uh, in, this, in this world, uh, people are facing the data solvency and data residency restrictions. If you, your customer uh, from certain countries or from certain, you know, like uh, parts of the world, uh, there are legal restrictions, and you have to place the data uh, in certain region. You cannot just uh, uh, have one region to serve uh, all your customers, especially in enterprise world. And because of that, uh, you may not have a choice but to decide to go with a multiple cloud window or even with a, hy a hybrid model of uh, cloud plus on-prem to serve different customers. Uh, another uh, reason multi-cloud has been uh, interesting nowadays uh, is the merger and acquisition. That's something I noticed uh, recently. Uh, in different economic uh, uh, environment and conditions, uh, a company may have consolidations. You know, some company acquire another company, and the merger and acquisition happen all the time. If a multiple company are combined, you probably realize that they're using different cloud vendors. And because of that, because of the migration cost has been so high, so a lot of times you are forced to operate in an environment with different cloud vendors. Uh, and that's why the multi cloud itself is important. Uh, with respect to DNS, uh, again, as I as I pointed out just a moment ago, uh, DNS actually uh, serves a diverse, diversified source information uh, to Kubicon, uh, to, you know, to DevOps and engineers at uh, Kubicon. You probably focus on customer facing services, but for IT admins, uh, they probably are more focusing on corporate uh, facing uh, services as well. So that's uh, information uh, bridging the world of IT admin as well as uh, DevOps and engineers. In multi-cloud uh, and uh, 
in multi, if you are dealing with the cloud, you probably want to use a, a DNS service from a cloud vendor. I do want to point out that the, the DNS service from cloud vendor may not be as reliable as you believe. As of right now, as far as I know, all three major cloud vendors from AWS, uh, uh, from Google Cloud and uh, Azure DNS give you 100% uh, SLA. Uh, that's a 100% service license agreement. However, this one is very much misleading. Why is this misleading? It's because uh, what does that mean for 100%? If uh, they, they, the service uh, disruption, what will be the consequence? The consequence, as far as I know, is that they will give you a, uh, a refund for the loss of service, but they will not give you a refund for the disruption of your service. So think about how much money you are spending every year on DNS. Now you can figure out if, you, if let's say AWS or Google Cloud or Azure uh, DNS has a service interruption for let's say a day, you probably can figure out the money is not that high and it's probably meaningless to you. <laughs> I mean, if you, have, if you, are, you are building a very critical service, in fact, uh, the company I worked for uh, several years ago, actually a couple of years ago, uh, encountered a service interruption uh, due to a DNS uh, outage from one cloud vendor. I'm not going to say who. The conversation with the cloud vendor was not that pleasant because after the calculation, we realized that we are only going to get a you know a service credit refund of about uh, you know hundred dollars or so. So the conversation, the meeting with the cloud window was like, oh, hey, you know, uh, uh, do you guys really want that like $100 back? Or maybe we can give you some gift card. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I, I'm just trying to point out, say, even though we rely on cloud windows, a lot of times the consequence may not be exactly what you ex ex expect unless you, you, know, you go into the details of the agreement, right? So that's why the company, with, uh, we started thinking, rethinking about our strategy, and we realized DNS itself is a very sensitive and critical service. We are thinking about the potential just building our service, uh, you know, just as a backup, because we cannot afford to have a, you know, our critical service lost like millions of dollars, but only get a, you know, a credit refund of like a hundred dollars, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, we 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 talk about CoreDNS as a project, and the one interesting about CoreDNS is that CoreDNS always have uh, cloud integration with all three vendors. Uh, people may ask why uh, why you why you use uh, cloud vendors API, uh, cloud vendors API to do integration? Why not just directly communicating with uh, DNS server from cloud vendors uh, directly? I mean, certainly UDP, you can, you can just uh, uh, send the UDP packet to let's say Raw 53's DNS server and they can exchange the data as well. But the reason uh, we use cloud vendors uh, API is that most of the API are, are HTTPS based, so it's a secure in comparison with uh, UDP. And uh, the Cloud Vendor API normally have authentication and authorization, which is uh, much better than UDP, which is almost available, right? Uh, and also TCP-based uh, protocol is certainly uh, a lot more reliable uh, and also give you a better error handling. And uh, finally, the integration with Cloud Vendors through the API uh, allows us to separate the data sync up and DNS query. So you can have uh, two channels, one channel to serving your customer, uh, serving your, let's say, corporate, um, uh, corporate IT world, and another channel is to, is to query the cloud vendor like, uh, you know, like RAW 53 or like uh, Google Cloud DNS uh, to do the data sync up. So again, like I said, the, the good thing about core DNS is that uh, you can consider coding as, as the central of uh, service discovery to fetch all the information from different sources, from your IT admin, from Kubernetes, from different cloud vendors, and you can serve, this, add, add the, serve uh, 
serve the DNS in one channel to every, everyone. So that's the advantage of core DNS in this uh, cloud integrations. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, actual uh, a potential usage of uh, using core DNS to wire up different cloud vendors data. Uh, this example is going to give you a, a it's going to wire up for AWS Rafi 3 and the Google Cloud DNS as well as your local DNS record. As you can see, the, you, can, you can have three plugins. The first plugin is to uh, use the Raw 53, which will talk to AWS to get the DNS information from AWS. And you can configure the, your core DNS to fall through uh, if, uh, the, if the DNS record is not available in Raw 53, and it can fall through to Google Cloud DNS. Uh, if the data is still not available in Google Cloud DNS, you can serve the DNS record yourself locally. Uh, this is a simple core file that will get the job done. And you can see the whole core file is like uh, 10 lines of configuration, and that will achieve the result of mixing uh, DNS uh, data from multiple windows as well as your local DNS. So that's, a, that's one example of coding as usage in service discovery. Uh, I'm going to walk through another one that's uh, going to be a demo plugin. As I promised uh, at the beginning of the session, I'm going to walk through a, a coding as a plugin that's written in Golang. But this, uh, don't worry, this uh, Golang plugin is very simple. Uh, what this plugin achieve is that it's a source IP based server discovery. Let's say you have uh, a DNS server and you want to your DNS server to serve different uh, uh, result based on the source IP. Let's say you are in a corporate network. You want to say if the query is from within your corporate network, you want to return one value. Let's say 1.1.1.1. And uh, if the, uh, let's say if the query is from outside or from the internet, you want to serve a different value. So you, you will have the same uh, DNS query name, like example.org, but the result will be totally different. So how, how to achieve that? You can write your own plugin in Golang, and uh, that's not going to be very difficult. I'm going to show a demo plugin. This plugin only consists of three major functions. The first function, that's the init function, will only do a one-time initialization. It will register the set of function with Caddy. Uh, by the way, for anyone not familiar with the Caddy or wondering why Caddy is in the picture, coding as was started as a fork of Caddy. <laughs> okay. It's uh, initially coding as what's called a Caddy DNS. So coding itself is like a plugin of Caddy itself, but then eventually it's uh, uh, evolved and uh, converted to a DNS focused, uh, I don't know, like a project. But initially it was a, a fork of Caddy. That's why you see some of reference of Caddy here. Uh, that's a unique plugin. The setup plugin will do several things. Basically, the setup plugin will pass the configuration, will, uh, will, will be called once for each of the uh, plugin in the core file so that uh, uh, your, your plugin can be configured properly. And finally, the server DNS is the, uh, is the main body of your plugin, and you want to put the functionality within server DNS to achieve what you uh, achieve your goal. Uh, I'm going to walk through those several uh, uh, the the Golang code, and you can see it's fairly straightforward. You need plugin; it's just uh, several lines of code to conf to reg register demo itself. The setup plugin is uh, to pass the uh, the configuration, but since the demo plugin is very simple, because we talk about uh, what we want to achieve, we just want to hard code, so the the setup is very simple as well. 
if you have additional configuration, you probably need to go deeper. But here, we just make it simple. Uh, and finally, the serve DNS, plus, uh, serve DNS function uh, is where the, the true logic happens. Uh, in this serve DNS, you will receive the uh, request and the response. You, the state will get the state of request. And uh, this request will, from the request, you can get the na uh, query name as well as the source IP of the request. That's only two information you care in most of the cases. Uh, as, as I explained, we try to uh, try to return different results based on the source IP. So if the source IP is from an uh, internal address, let's say 127 or 172, then we are going to re return a uh, unique IP of 1.1.1.1. And if the source IP is from outside the world, uh, then by default it will return 8.8.8.8. I pick up those two numbers randomly, so because those two numbers actually are not going to uh, be very useful. The 1.1.1.1, that's the Cloudflare's uh, DS server, and the 8.8.8.8, that's uh, Google DS server, but that's just example. You can certainly decide to go any way you want if you if you're serious about writing a, a Golang plugin. But that's uh, pretty much all you need to do to construct a demo plugin and uh, you can build the uh, plugin easily. Uh, before we talk about building the plugin, you also want to have a core file associated with it. But as I explained, we try to hard code uh, our configuration. So the core file, all you need to do is just specify demo so that the demo plugin will be invoked. And that's uh, steps to build the plugin. Uh, <laughs> the building the plugin is a little convoluted, but I here I give you one command line. If you can copy this command line, if you can run uh, with Docker, then it will build the plugin for you. So this one command line will give you everything. And after you build the binary, you can just run locally uh, with uh, uh, dot slash coding as and if you just uh, serve your need. The demo plugin is available in coding as uh, uh, in coding as website, so you can certainly take a look. Uh, I, I did account the total line of code is 80 lines, so that's not a lot. And uh, interestingly, uh, serving, uh, interestingly, uh, serving different records based on source IP is one of the most uh, requested features by community. We didn't do that, but we encourage people to take a look at Golang, and it's very simple, right? So you, you probably would rather, would rather write a Golang code yourself why we didn't support this is because the configuration can be very convoluted if we go with this route, right? People will say, hey, uh, you, have a, you have a different configuration, you have, let's say, the, what will be a source IP, or what, it will be a long list, uh, what kind of format uh, you have to present. We realize it's probably too convoluted to serve everyone's need, but if you have a specific request, say you just want to return different results based on the source IP, and you know exactly source IP, you can just copy the demo plugin and make some small modifications and it will serve your need. Okay. Okay, so we are almost uh, approaching to the end of the session, so I wanted to uh, just, uh, for, for anyone who uh, interest in coding as I want to make contributions. There are several ways to make contributions. First of all, you can start coding as in GitHub. So let's see if we can reach to the next milestone. We are reach uh, 10,000 stars. So maybe we can uh, increase the number even further because that's the only thing matters in this day and age, right? <laughs> Um, you can also add the name of your institution or company to adopters.md. That also means you can create a pull request and uh, you become a contributor yourself. And finally, if you want to be a maintainer, uh, as I explained, 
you only need to contribute one significant pull request. I mean, a uh, typo or some small uh, bug fix may not matter, right, <laughs> unfortunately. And then you can find one maintainer to sponsor you, and you will be added as uh, coding as maintainer. And I do want to say the coding as community has been fairly friendly. If you contribute a significant pull request, I can guarantee you, you can find some sponsor to, uh, to introduce you as a maintainer. Okay, I think that's uh, pretty much it. So maybe we can talk about any questions. <laughs> And any questions? Hi. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, some requests inside of a cluster might not need DNS. You're, it was like a section, do you need DNS if anymore within a cluster? Uh, and you talked about how talking to external services, you still need it, but um, is that ringing any bells for you? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure about your question. Maybe you can uh, um, elaborate a little like with some sure. examples. Uh, it was around service discovery and um, I, th I thought what you were saying is uh, when one service is talking to another, it might not need to make a DNS request for that because it's handled by a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so I, I think uh, you're talking about if DNS is necessary. So in this day and age, you know we have a SDN, software defined networking. With software defined networking, your IP can be wired up in any way you want. The traditional way of well, you have a cluster, it has been a certain side of block, it has a restriction, say, slash 16 or slash 24, it's not truly relevant anymore in SDN age. Because in SDN, you can have one virtual machine side by side in another virtual machine, they can be in totally different IP. And you can even hard code a machine with the IP, right? But, so that, that, that's my reference to uh, the DNS versus the, the so-called SDN words of uh, static IPs. You can just say, okay, I have one virtual machine, I'm going to assign static IP. I know this is static IP is 1.1.1.1, it will never change. So th that's a question some people ask, okay, why do you still need DNS in this case? But my answer was that even in this case, you want to have DNS because DNS give you an indirection, and the indirection is something uh, you want to maintain. And changing DNS is always going to be easy in comparison to change the SDN configuration, even though SDN is a lot easier in comparison to like many years ago. In many years ago, with your switch or router, you're, you're, you're limited by your switch router, but nowadays it's the limitation of SDN uh, is much less compared with many years ago, right? So that's, that's my comment about the SDN or the DNS is still relevant. Okay, so the static IP would be like a cluster IP for a service, is that? Uh, in your cluster, I mean, normally in, you know, like in your, let's say when, when you try to operate in reality, your cluster may still be within the same side of block, right? Because that's easy, because that's traditional way of how people maintaining the network. But underlying, if, if you look deeper, you can, if you want to go with SDN rod, you can go any way you want. Your, your cluster can be totally shuffled with different IP addresses and they can be totally unrelated, but you can always have a point-to-point -point delivery from one, you know, packet can be delivered from one to another and they can be totally outside of a, a default side of block. So that's why I'm saying like the restriction is much less nowadays, but uh, what should I say? Because traditionally people operating in a way uh, with uh, some side block restrictions, uh, with uh, different hops. So if we are going to, uh, what, what should I say? Uh, unless you're building something totally new, you probably just want to add a DNS to allow you to have a certain flexibility. And that 
flexibility, it's going to reward you in case you make a change. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any, any other questions? Oh, okay. Hi, great talk. Um, I was wondering about the plugin system that you showed. Yeah. The thing I'm wondering is um, if they are chaining together, yeah. how do you know that they're not going to step on each other? So how as a um, plugin writer do you know where do you plug in compared to other plugins? Uh, are you asking about question about out of the plugin? Yeah. Okay, so that is actually interesting. So that you probably noticed that in coding as at least the plugin has to be compiled. You cannot at least you cannot easily, let's say, dynamically load a plugin. That's actually by design because uh, sometimes you may need to recompile the code. If you don't recompile the code, there is an order that specifies in plugin dot the config file, and uh, it will walk through one by one. And that's one of the reasons you see the init uh, function to initialize and set up the plugin because. If a plugin is not in use, you probably even don't want them to go through the chain. So like in, let me show you one example. Like in this case, if you only build a demo and uh, your, your coding as you, you re recompile with, with only demo, then in this case, it will only work through a demo plugin. All other plugins will not even be touched. But the order you can define. The, the order is specified in the uh, plugin.cfg file. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And oh, one more, one more question. Um, a security requirement in my cluster is that I, I may want one tenant application to have a short list of DNS zones which they are allowed to make lookups to, mm -hmm. and then I have another application with a different short white list of DNS zones, mm -hmm. and. I was, as a, I saw your example plugin, and I was wondering, would it be possible to, based on the caller pod's namespace and not the caller pod's IP, to serve a different IP address for the same domain? Would it be feasible to write such a plugin? Okay, so are you asking the question of? Uh, uh, okay, so in DNS case, DNS normally have like a query and the response, and the, the query uh, normally carries a, a query name plus the source IP because that's only two reliable information, right? Uh, are, are you trying to say that if we manipulating the record based on the uh, the query name, uh, if a query name is in namespace based, is that the question? Uh, no, no, suppose that one DNS request uh, yeah. originates from some particular namespace, okay. and from that namespace, I yeah. want that only lookups towards the google.com zone should succeed, whereas all other queries should be dropped. Okay, okay so that, okay, so that, that might be a little, a uh, little tricky. So, you no, know, like when DNS, let's say the DNS, uh, see the, the DNS query, the only reliable information, as I mentioned, a uh, query name and the source IP. If you say you want the, the DNS reply to be based on the namespace, which, which means the namespace is going to be uh, within a Kubernetes cluster, I think that's the question, right? In this case, I think. Uh, you first have to make sure different namespace are potentially pointing to different uh, DNS servers, right? Or maybe they point to the same server, but you have to make sure they expose a, a, a different, uh, let's say, the DNS IP address so that you can distinguish them. I've already written such an implementation, but I was wondering if I had made things harder than they'd have to be. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going to say you probably need to go into the go line to, to make some, something happen. I, I'm not sure you can just uh, grab a core file and make some, you know, some core file manipulation to make this happen. I think uh, some go line implementation might be needed to achieve what you, you want. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any, any other questions? Um, thank you very much for the great talk. I was wondering whether uh, you just said plugins have to be compiled, but is it possible to control Cordian as at runtime, for example, using custom operators or custom resource definitions? So basically, I'm asking is it possible to write a Cordian as plugin that watches custom resources and adjusts, for example, routing at runtime? Uh, I, I think you mentioned the uh, plugin. Compile. Are you talking about a dynamic loading a plugin? So no, when when the plugin is already running in Cordian yeah. S, yeah. is it possible that the plugin accesses the Cube API and reacts to changes dynamically? Uh, the the Kubernetes plugin, including us, actually will will map the Kubernetes uh, uh, the the Kubernetes APIs, uh, you know, the backend data. So it it are they achieving that? If you have any special request, special need to manipulating those data. Uh, Many times it's already possible, but you, you have to be a little creative in, uh, in manipulating core file if you don't want to go with the uh, Golang route. Otherwise, you know, for, for, for some, some of the, uh, at least the community members, I noticed that they, they feel like it's just a little, you know, like uh, too, what's, uh, it's too hardcore to go into manipulating different uh, core file to get a little creative. They just say, okay, so it's not difficult to write a go long. So they just write go long because that's not too difficult to write a coding as plugin, as you can see, right? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and any other questions? Okay, if no other questions, I think that's it for today. Thanks everyone for joining this session. Have a great day.